Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. We'll start reading verse number 1. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 1. The Bible says this. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> we thank you for this day, God. We're thankful for your word. Uh, we're thankful, Lord, for this passage of scripture. Uh, so familiar to some, Lord, and, and we're thankful, God, that you give us these, Lord, and you make things so clear to us. Um, and God, we pray today, Lord, you, we just want to honor you as we study your word together, Father. We just want to lift you up, um, like Stephanie said, in your proper place, Lord, as our king. And, and God, we thank you for your truths, Lord. I pray that we would be challenged by your word today, God. I pray, Lord, that, that it would challenge us truly. And we would open our hearts and minds, God. We wouldn't focus on anything but you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Alrighty, so let's look now. Let's let's think about this this passage. This is a passage that we that many of you know so well. We've looked at it before over the years, um, but it's one that we have to we have to anchor ourselves in. This is one that, that challenges us. This is one that we have to know so well that 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 we can we can live our life in these verses. We can we can stay in these verses. We can hold on to them in the good and the bad. Um, th these are verses. Th these are. These are foundational, Christian. These are foundational verses that me and you live in. This is this is this is why we're here. Um, and and verse number one, he said, "And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins." He's talking to the Christian readers here at Ephesus, right? He's talking to them. He's talking about himself. He's talking to me and you. Whenever he's talking about this, he's talking to Christians, and that that's this is to me and you. This context. Is to them, and it's all also to us. It's true for them. It, it was true for them, just like it's true for me and you now. He said, and you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. He begins this next thought. He's been talking about Christ. In chapter 1, he gave all kind of beautiful truths about Christ. And he, and he, said, um, <coughs> he said that God the Father put all things under Christ's feet and made Christ to be the head over all things of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He's talked about Christ's um, goodness and Christ's completeness and how Christ is above all, and he's seated at the right hand of God, and he, he, made, um, he, he, he won the victory at the cross of Calvary, and, and he secured salvation for Christians. Um, and, and then he changes it, and he said, And in you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. We, we have to, we, in order for me and you to understand salvation, in order for us to understand where we stand in Christ, we have to understand that we were once dead in trespasses and sins, Christians. And those of you that are not Christians, you have to understand that you are dead in your trespasses and sins. You have no life. You have no spiritual life. You're spiritually dead. And, and the, the 
terrible part about that death is you don't even know you're dead. You're spiritually dead and you don't know it. That's, that, that's the worst kind of death, right? That's the worst kind of death whenever it's something that you don't even understand or know. It's like a thing about it in a, in a perfectly um, in a practical, normal way that maybe me and you can understand is maybe y'all married people. Some of y'all may have had arguments and stuff like that before. Um, me and Holly never have. Right? <laughs> but really think about it in a marriage. If you have a marriage and there's some kind of a problem in your marriage, right? Maybe one of the one of you is doing something that the other one is really hurting their feelings, it's really is it's, it's bothering them, right? But but the one who's doing it has no idea that they're doing something that's bothering the spouse. They have, they don't even realize they're doing it. They, they don't even know that it's bothering their spouse. And they just continue to do it because they don't even know it's a problem. And the spouse that's being hurt never even tells the other one that what they're doing is hurting them. And they, you go on and on in this cycle of being hurt, and the other one's doing it over and over and has no idea they're doing it. It's never even brought to their attention. Um, and, and maybe y'all can relate to that, right? My, probably everybody who's married can relate to that in some way. What's the, same, the, the, the premise is the same to these people that are spiritually dead. They have no idea they're dead. They have no idea they're dead. Um, Christian, we have to tell them, right? You, somebody has to tell them. Somebody has to show them. Um, somebody has to has to make them understand that they're dead. They're they're spiritually dead, and it's hard to say that to a, to a person that's upright and walking. But but that's what Christ said. And you, He made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. And then He's going to explain this better to us to try to help us understand, Christian. Try to take yourself there, and we're going to look at this. And as we look at it, we'll understand that this is a very interesting thought that He gives us here. He said, "In which you once walked, Christian." According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air, according to, to Satan, he said, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Think about it again. In which you once walked according to the course of this world. You who are dead in trespasses and sins, once you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of air, who Satan who is in charge of the world. Right. So Now think about that. Now that's hard for some, some of you. Um, it's hard to think like that because maybe you were, um, maybe the Lord saved you whenever you were a child or you were very young, right? And and and, and in your obviously you've had a, a walk with Christ since you were very young, and, and obviously there's been there's been valleys, there's been sins, there's been seasons of sin, uh, but it's hard for you to kind of get your mind there and and to understand that. Maybe for some of you others, maybe it's not so hard because you didn't come to Christ until you were much older, right? You were in your adult life, so you can see, you can. You can visualize what that looked like to walk according to the course of this world. Now, Christian, now, Christian, I want you to understand, and, and, and it, all of us who are, everybody who was, even if you were saved at a young age, you've had seasons of sin. You've had times in your life where you walked in sin for a period of time, right? Um, well, well. so for you to understand what he's saying is that would have been the course of your life, that, that sin that you walked in. Um, if you were, even if you did it for a period of time, you were unrepentant about it. That's what that, that's the premise here. You walked according to the course of the world. This person that's spiritually dead and doesn't know it, they do whatever. They just live their life and make themselves happy. Maybe they're pretty decent people. They pay all their bills. They don't beat their spouse. They feed their children, um, but they're spiritually dead nonetheless because they they do not live to God's standard, which is absolute perfection. Um, let's go on a little further. And I think we'll understand a little better when we get to verse number three. He said, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Look at this again. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh. See if this rings a bell for any of you. Uh, according to the lust of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of your flesh and of your mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Your very nature was opposite to God, all of us. Your very nature was opposite to God. You walked according to the course of the world. You were fulfilling the lusts of your mind, the lusts of your flesh. You were fulfilling those things, right? And then he said, and you were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Now, I want y'all to think about something. This is very interesting in verse number three. He said, among whom also we all once. Paul said, all of us. He's talking to me and you. He's talking to all those at Ephesus. Now, the interesting part about Paul is he said, we all. He's talking about himself, too. Paul was a very religious man before he came to Christ. It's very interesting to think about this. Now, Paul's not saying I was a, you know, when he, he's describing these things that make me and you think about somebody that's just a, you know, um, 
it, it would make you think about somebody who's just, man, they're just out there. They're just, they're just partying and just going wild. They don't take care of their kids and they're always in jail and they're, they hurt other people. They're just this horribly wicked person. That's what might come to your mind when you see they fulfilling the lust of the flesh and the lust of the mind and the desire, you know, the, all these desires. That might be what comes to your mind first. But Paul was a religious man. He was a religious fanatic. He was a religious fanatic who knew the, the God's word frontward and backward. He knew what it said. Probably could quote most of the Old Testament, if not all of it. He could quote it. And he understand it, that he was spiritually dead. He was spiritually dead. He was walking according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air. He had no idea. He was upright in his own mind in, in his religiosity. That's a very interesting thing to think about whenever we see that verse. So it's not just the guy who's in prison for a bunch of murders. It's the religious people like Paul that did not know Christ, but they were religious in their own minds. Whether that be the religion that, that, that they were, uh, these Pharisees and Sadducees and Jewish people, like they're still Jewish Orthodox people that are spiritually dead. These Jewish people that they and they, they they are upright in their own eyes. They they believe that they are right with God, but they are spiritually dead apart from Jesus Christ. Now that's interesting to think about. So it's the person that like Paul who was upright and revered by everybody and was the the people that really thought a lot of, and the the thief that was. That was being, you know, imprisoned there in Paul's day or whatever. That, that they were in the exact same condition. Now, now, now here, now here's the thought. I wonder how many religious people are in churches right now, all across Harrison County and Georgia, maybe even here today. How many religious people are in this same boat? They're spiritually dead. They're apart from Christ. They don't know Jesus Christ, but they're always at church. But they know that they, they they know this scripture I just read to you. They they could probably tell you about it, tell you what it says and what it means. Um, however, they don't know Christ. They don't know him. And they are in the same condition that the person in prison is. They're, they're, they're for killing you know, five people. They're in the same exact condition. They're spiritually dead. Paul said, whenever I was a religious man, I was conducted myself in the lust of my flesh. I fulfilled the desires of my flesh and of my mind. I was by nature a child of wrath. Just as the others. Very interesting. We, sometimes we, we have faults. We, we have these false understandings of God and who God is. Now, now that, that religious person, religiously upright, um, has the pedigree, has the, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've always gone to church. I'm there every time the doors are open. I'm, um, I know the Bible. I teach Sunday school. Maybe I, I preach. I do all these wonderful things. However, I don't know Jesus Christ. Um, it's very interesting. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange thing to think about, but that's what the Bible's challenging me and you right here to consider. It's challenging me and you to look at and consider these things. Um, look at verse number four. Now, now, we've seen all this bad news about death and, and, and wickedness and being a child of wrath by nature. Um, and then verse number four is wherever everything changes. And it says, he said, he said, but God. That's how he started verse number four, but God. And that's the, um, that's the verse that, 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 that part, those two words right there are the, the, the it's kind of like the transformational part of, of everyone's life, right? Because me and you, Christian, we're in the same boat in verses one through three. And then, but God, but God intervened at some point in mine and your life. And man, what a wonderful thing that is. But God, see, and, and that's that's how that this that those two words are the the thing that can. Um, it's not only the part that transforms lives, but it's the part that that like um, it's the part that that God is able to bring wonderful things from terrible things. You know, God is that God only God is able to take a catastrophic situation and make something good come out of it in the very end. Right, the end that me and me and you never. Sometimes we we. We, it may be so far ahead that we can't even see it, but God can make something beautiful out of that, and that's only God can do that. Only the life giver does that. Only God does that. This person who made alive, you see this, and you he made alive right there. Now, now that, only God gives life. God is a life giver, okay? Only God gives life, and that's a very interesting thing for me and you to talk about it. Now, I don't want to be political and I don't, or anything like that, but I want us to me and you just to be challenged for a second whenever we see that, and you he made alive. Um, that God, this God who, who made our universe out of nothing, right? He, he, he made it out of nothing. Like that, He didn't take a piece of 
a piece of something and make something. He, there was nothing, and God made our universe. And he's the one that gives life. He's the one that gave me and you life. He's the one that gave your children their life and, 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 and your grandchildren. He is the life giver. Now, I want us to think about something and be challenged by this. If God is the life giver, um, where does that leave a Christian's stance on abortion? Where does mine and your stance go on abortion if we believe that God is the life giver? We believe that only God gives life and only God takes life. Only God can do that. And we believe he is sovereign over, over circumstances. Um, we believe that nothing comes to pass in life that doesn't first go through God's hands. Nothing slips through his grasp. Now, if all those things are true, where do we stand on abortion? Where do we stand on that? I don't care about the Democrats or the Republicans. Where do we stand as Christians, followers of Christ? There's only one place for me and you to be on that. There's only one place for a follower of Christ to stand when it comes to abortion. If we believe, if we really believe that God is the life giver, there's only one place for us to stand. That's a hard thing to consider because whenever we, um, whenever we, you, you think about that, people always that they always go to um, people that love them, that people that are really pro-abortion. They always, they, you know, the political talking points. They go to the the. Um, the catastrophic, like what if a, per, a woman was assaulted? What you know, they always go to those things, um, which which is a, a very small percentage of actual abortions. You know, that, first of all, but but nonetheless, that that's where they always go. But still, I want me and you to be challenged now. If we believe that God is the life giver, just be challenged. I just want you to consider where do you stand on that? I'm not going to tell you where to stand, but where do we stand? If we truly believe that God gives life, where do we stand? That's a hard thing. That's a hard question because some things are just terrible. Some circumstances are horrific, right? So it's hard to it's hard to even take yourself there because you, you know because it, it, it's easier to say, easier said than done, always, right? But but where where do we stand? And, we, and you have to consider that. You need to pray and, and seek God on that. Um, but God is the life giver. He, he's the one that that made me and you sitting here today, and all those people that we love. God made them. He, he's the one who breathes life into us. He's the one that's holding us all together, right? Um, and you, he made alive. Who were dead in your trespasses and sins. But God, look at verse number four. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Now, that's very interesting. But God, you're dead in your trespasses and sins, meaning you walked according to the course of the world, lust of your flesh, lust of your mouth, fulfilling every desire that you have, whatever that may be. He said, but God, who is rich in unfavorable kindness, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, God, who is rich in un un unmerited favor, undeserved favor toward me and you because of the great love with which he loved us. God loves me and you so much, Christian. So much more than we could ever possibly imagine. So much more than we could ever possibly wrap our mind around. God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Because of God, God loves you so much and because of his love, he gave you mercy. Um, because of his mercy, he is rich in mercy and because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. But God, who is rich in unmerited favor because of his great love with which he loved us. God loves me and you so much, and he just loves us because he loves us. Not because we are deserving of his love. Not because we have done something to earn his love. Not because we are... Um, we, 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 have, we have more on the good side than on the bad side. God loves us because he loves us. Because he has unmerited favor towards me and you. Um, whenever we think about this, it, it's so hard. And, and sometimes the circumstances in our life take us to places and we're like, we don't feel loved or we feel like people that should have loved us didn't love us or they didn't love us enough. And and, 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 and a lot of those ways to feel are probably fair. In a lot of situations, right, so it's normal to feel that way. Um, but for me and you just to really try to embrace the fact and try to understand the fact that God loves me and you so much more than we could ever possibly imagine. So much more than, than me and you realize or understand. So much more than, than anybody in your life could ever love you. God loves you so much. And even though you don't always feel that, right, that you don't always 100% of the time just feel so loved by God. Um, but God tells us that he loves us, and that's not based on my and your feelings. It's not based on the way we feel in a current circumstance. It's true because God said it's true, right? It's true because he said it's true. 
And, and if God says it's true, then it's just true. And, and we can we can we can hold on to that, right? Despite how I feel, despite how you feel, <laughs> despite how the circumstances are going, I know God loves me because He said that. It said that He's rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us. He made us alive. Look at verse number. Even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. That's why you have different desires now. Person, Christian. That's why you have different desires. That's why the things that you once ran to, you don't run to them anymore. Because God has changed your nature. He's taken a dead shell. He's taken a person that was physically walking around but was spiritually dead, and He's given you spiritual life. That's why that even though you know that sometimes you, you're drawn back to those places, right? That's why ultimately you don't want to go there anymore. You know where it leads to, and you know the problems that come from it. And, and, and you know that if you go back there, nothing good is going to come out of it. And then if you do find yourself going back there and dipping your toe back in the water, you feel guilty about it, and you, and you feel convicted. That's because God is changing you. God, God, is, God is changing you step by step. Right? It typically, God typically doesn't change us all at once. He typically takes a lifetime to change us and change us and change us, and not to perfection, but he works on us all the way to the finish line. Right? But, but here's the thing. Whenever you find yourself not being drawn back to where you once went to, don't give yourself any credit. Get all the credit. Give all the credit to God, right? Give all the honor and all the credit to Him because it's Him that's doing the work in you. It's Him that's transforming you. It's Him that's molding you. It's Him that's shaping you. He said, even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Even when you were dead in trespasses, Christian, He made us alive together with Christ. Look at verse number 6. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So he, he took you from spiritual death to spiritual life. He, he changed you. When you were dead, he made you alive. And then he said he raised you up and he made you sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Um, and then he said that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So that in, in this verse, this is something that is hard to even comprehend. But in the ages to come, he's going to show his grace, his amazing grace towards people like me and you. We're going to be in some way a display of God's grace and mercy in heaven. Right? It says that, that it... Um, the angels will be amazed, right? The angels will be amazed at the wisdom and love of God as they see Christians, people like me and you, that God took from spiritual death to spiritual life. The angels will be amazed at how good God is. We're going to be putting God's grace on display for all to see. See, it's all about Him, right? It's all about God's glory and God's honor in, in mind in your life. It's not about you. We're not the main character. It's about Him. And, and, and but His love is going to be a, 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 an example, a... a, a um, it's going to put on display his grace and his mercy and his love. And it's very interesting to think about. That's so far out there and so deep. You shouldn't say far. It's so deep that it's hard for me to even begin to wrap my mind around that, right? Whenever I try to think about that, what does that mean to say that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus? And that's after he said he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that, that, that's just so deep that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, his unmerited favor and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus look at verse number 8 he said for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's a very interesting, very foundational verse for me and you to stay in right here. Verse number 8. It's very important that me and you understand this. And we, we, we live our life in this verse. For by grace, for by God's unmerited favor, you have been saved through faith. For by God's unmerited favor, you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Men will try to take everything and they will twist God's word in any way that they can to make it about me and you doing something for salvation. They'll, they'll do anything they can do. And, and, they, and they'll, they'll twist it and they'll turn it and they'll take verses and they'll just say, what about this verse? And they'll just read one verse and then, 
and, and they'll do anything they can do because we want to have some form of control over this, right? We want to have some tangible thing that you can say, right? I was baptized for my salvation, right? I, I, when I got baptized, that's when God saved me. When I, that, that's the kind of things they'll say. Or they'll say things like, um, you have to... Um, you, you have to do these things. There's a series of things that you need to do, physical things that you need to do in order to be saved, right? They, 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 they'll, they'll put all these things in it because men desperately want a, some control and some type of assurance by work, by doing something, right? Not only that, but then they can, they can share some of the credit for it. Um, but God said, for by grace you have been saved through faith. We're just like Abraham, right? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. The Bible tells me that all throughout, Abraham believed God. God told him he would take, come out of his country, leave his family, come out of his country. God was going to make him a father of many nations. By Through him, all the people of the earth would be blessed. He would have children that would be more than the stars in the sky, right? And we're all descendants of Abraham by faith is what the Bible tells us, right? We're, we're descendants of Abraham through faith. Um, and, and, and so since the beginning, that's been God's plan of salvation. For by grace, Christian, you have been saved through faith, by your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. By God's unmerited favor, you have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You have no reason to brag in your salvation, Christian. You have no reason to be puffed up whatsoever. God has taken you from spiritual death to spiritual life, and he's done that by grace, through faith. By grace, by his unmerited favor, through your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and his redeeming work. It's so important that we and you understand that. It's important that we stay there because if me and you can understand that, what we'll do is, is we'll give Christ all the credit in our salvation. We won't tell stories about you know, being baptized and we won't tell our, our story won't be about the, these works that we did and we did this mission and that mission and we handed out this many things and we rode this many miles on our bicycles and we, we, won't, we won't come up with any of that stuff. All that stuff will be left to the wayside and we won't even be concerned with it. Our main focus will be on our king. Your main focus will be on the king because he, all the credit and all the honor and all the glory goes to him. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Memorize that verse. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Right? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the Lord said, Build a boat, you build a boat. Right? You remember when Noah, Noah, it was a very perverse generation that Noah lived in. Do you think Noah was the perfect man that lived amongst all these people? No, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God had mercy on Noah. Right? And Noah believed God. How do we know he believed him? Because he built the boat. He believed God. Right? And then afterwards, we saw Noah. He was just like everybody else, just like me and you. He was a flawed man. Flawed man, just like us. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And, 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 the, and, and we just see it all throughout. And, and it always just points us to Christ. We're just pointed to Christ. That ark was a picture of Christ. It was a picture of salvation, death and destruction, and God's judgment all around but that ark was the place of safety. You see Christ in that? Whenever we think about Noah's ark, we see Christ in the boat. That's, that's Christ, our, our ark, our, our place of safety, our place to, that saves us from God's wrath. Um, and, and let's go on. For, we're, for, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And now look at this. For we are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. <clears throat> Here's where we go, what we do, Lord. What we do as Christians is not our salvation. By grace, you've been saved through faith. And then he said, but we are God's masterpiece. We've been created in Christ Jesus for good works. So not only did God save you, he took you from spiritual death to spiritual life. He made you alive. He gave you a brand new life in Christ Jesus. And then the Bible says that you're his masterpiece. And he said you have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. So he didn't just save us, just sit on the sideline. He saved you for good works. He saved you that in this new life that you now have in him, you are to walk in a different way than you once did. And you're actually supposed to do good works. These good works do not produce your salvation, but they are a result of your salvation. And then look at this. Very interesting what he said after that. You're his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. And then look at that. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He has saved you. By grace through faith, he's created you in Christ Jesus for good works. He's made you a masterpiece. You're like a painting that he's making, a perfect masterpiece that he's making. 
you, you've been um, created in Christ for good works. And then he said this, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. So just in case we were going to get braggadocious about the good works that we're walking in in Christ, he said that God has prepared them beforehand that you should walk in them. He's made a way for you. He's put these circumstances in place for you to walk there. You see, how, man, it always just goes back to him, don't it? It just, it just, the Bible just constantly takes me and you back to Christ, back to God, back to the Holy Spirit. We're, we're constantly just drawn back to him, which God has prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. God has already prepared all these things for you to do. God has placed them in your path. Whenever we see these things, whenever God brings me and you to cross paths with someone, whenever he brings people into our life, whenever God um, puts a... a uh, a burden on your heart to help someone when all these things that come your way the Holy Spirit you know convicts us or nudges us to do this or that um, all these things are by God's design by this creator of the universe he brings people in your life everybody in this room right now we've been brought into each other's life not by some random thing where we just happen to be here no God has brought us here together um, according to his will. And he's prepared good works for every Christian in this room to walk in. Every one of us has been, he has prepared that for me and you. And this is always shaping us and molding us into the image of the Son. Right? This, this unattainable goal that me and you strive for that we'll never get anywhere close to, but nonetheless God is making us and shaping us and forming us. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, and then that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's the, it's, I mean, how, how do you not, it, it's a miracle, it's amazing, it's a miracle, it's a story that only God could write, it's a story that no man could come up with. Um, Christian, settle in right there. Just settle into these verses. Settle in to God's goodness and God's grace. Settle in to, to this story being all about Christ. Settle in to your faith. Um, your faith, you know, that, and that's the interesting thing about faith is, is why me and you, the reason that we need help with our faith, the, the, the reason that we need God to, to, to help cement us there in our faith is because it's normal for me and you to have doubts, right? Every Christian in this room, if you're honest with yourself, you've had times where you, you, you've thought, like, is this true, right? Is this like, is this where I, like, is this a waste or, you know, is, is, is God really there, right? That, it's normal for us that, to have those thoughts, those doubts, right? That, that's, those are normal. Those are normal, but, but that's whenever we just choose God. We choose to believe Him and His Word, no matter how we feel, no matter what the doubt is. Oh, man, if God, I can't believe I did this. I'm not really a Christian, or God's not even real. Why would God let this happen? Or I, sometimes I just don't feel, I just feel so empty, and I just don't feel like that God is there. You know, all those ways that we feel and all those doubts that we have, that's okay. It's okay to feel like that. We, 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 we don't have to beat ourselves up over that. We can just say that. Um, God, I, help me. I, I, I'm going to choose you and your word right now. I'm going to choose to believe you and what you say, not how I feel, not these doubts that are coming to my mind. Help me with this, Lord. That's okay. That's okay. Um, Christ has been good. He, he, he has been good to me and you. Um, and we owe him all the honor and all the Let's pray and then we'll have a song. Father, we uh, thank you for your word, God. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you've uh, blessed us, Father, more than we could ever possibly deserve. God, we we owe it all to you, Lord, um, all of our praise, all of our honor. Uh, we owe you our life, God. You've been so good to us, Father. We're thankful for our salvation. We're thankful, God, that you've had grace and mercy on us, and we're so undeserving. Lord, I pray, Lord, you would help us to plant here. God, help us to memorize these verses. Lord, help, help them to be foundational to us, God. I pray that every Christian in here would be encouraged by your word, Lord. I pray that we would embrace the fact that we're your, we are your masterpiece, God. You're molding us and shaping us, Father. Help us, Lord, as only you can. Father, if there's one here that don't know you, God, I pray you'd save them, Lord. I pray, God, you would take them to death for life, Lord, as only you can. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings, Father.